Alleluia, Christ is risen. Morning and welcome to the Church of St. Martin in the Fields on this exquisite spring morning. We are very glad you're here, whether you're in the congregation or joining us online. Welcome, and a special welcome to our preacher this morning, the Reverend Dr. Reed Brickman. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of the bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
A reading from the book of Acts. Peter addressed the people, you Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us? As though by our own power or piety we had made him walk. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect help in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the first letter of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. 
you know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you, while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. God, the Holy Trinity. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So, when I was in my senior year of high school, I discovered a way to cheat the system. I found out that if I wore a suit and a tie to school, basically I could go anywhere that I wanted. <laughs> I grew up in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, and students at my large suburban public high school did not dress up very often, and we did not wear uniforms. So when students did wear something that was a little bit dressier to school, it was normally because we had some kind of extracurricular activity that day. So, for example, the football team would wear ties on the days when they had a game, or the debate club would dress up before leaving school early to attend a debate tournament. I was not on either of those teams, but there were 800 people in my graduating class and a host of clubs and teams at my high school. So if I stood up in math class wearing a suit and I gave my teacher kind of one of these, no one could say for sure that there wasn't somewhere I was supposed to be that day. In my suit, I could walk through the halls without a pass. I could strut straight out the door. Nobody ever questioned me. 
And it's good that they didn't, because honestly, I don't know what I would have said if they had. You see, back in high school, I liked to think of myself, and I worked very hard to present myself as a good kid. I got decent grades, I didn't get in trouble, and so skipping school was somewhat out of character. And even when I did leave the school wearing my suit, I didn't really do anything. Most of the time, I would just go home after lunch on a Friday and play Nintendo. <laughs> but this deceit, relatively innocuous as it was, it nevertheless weighed on my conscience. I, I told myself I wasn't lying. I was just, you know, leaving. Part of why I felt permitted to do this in high school is because I kind of felt like I was done. I had already accumulated all the credits that I needed to graduate. I was already accepted into college. To some degree, I felt like the rules no longer applied to me. I had that attitude of worldly wisdom that high school seniors can sometimes have and the attitude that quickly evaporates once they become college freshmen. So transitions are always tricky for anyone, and one of the things that made this transition tricky for me was that I was going to Bible college to become a Pentecostal pastor. Looking at me today, you might be able to tell I did not become a Pentecostal pastor, even though this was a call that I had felt since I was 11 years old. Because of that, perhaps, I really, truly felt like I was done with school. I didn't go to any end-of-the-year social gatherings. I didn't go to any last football games. I was late for my graduation. I left early. I was 18 years old and already in that pulpit. And I had no time for unimportant things like algebra or signing yearbooks. I didn't become that Pentecostal pastor. I did get very close, however, in truth, attending Bible college ended up being the hardest season of my life. I ended up doubting basically everything that I believed about God and rethinking almost everything that I thought I knew about myself. Thankfully, by the grace of God, I traveled through that bleak tunnel of doubt and I emerged on the other side. Along the way, I had become profoundly humbled and more aware of the contours of God's grace. And looking back on that season and thinking about all the ways that I have been blessed since then, I have one thought that comes to my mind, and it is one that I want to reflect on you with a few more minutes today. This is it. This is the thought. God calls us to become who we are, and that is harder work than we realize. This is a theme in our second reading from today, from the New Testament book of 1 John. Bible scholars, we don't really know a lot of specifics about 1 John. The work is anonymous, so we don't know who wrote it. The work is not addressed, so we don't know who read it. Together with 2 and 3 John, these three documents are named John, not necessarily because someone named John wrote them, but because they seem to have an affinity with the gospel of John. There are certain themes and vocabularies, uh, kind of uh, trends that they share. So the when and the where of 1 John are similarly unclear, but we can say that it is from the early 2nd century CE. It was a composition that circulated among Gentile early Christian groups. And like the Gospel of, first, uh, like the Gospel of John, 1 John is interested in Jesus' commandment to love one another as I have loved you. In some ways, this, this uh, letter attempts to flesh out what that commandment means within the context of a community. So in the passage we heard this morning, the author addresses the early community of Jesus followers as children of God. It happens over and over again in the composition, children of God. And that term is not just a nice sentiment. It comes out of a theological framework that's borrowed from the Old Testament that implies relational obligations. And so this is, this is how it goes. These are the relational obligations of being a child of God. God loves you. You didn't ask for that love. You didn't do anything to deserve that love. God just loves you. 
Now, you don't have to be good in order to keep God's love. But because God loves you, you will be transformed. And you will become good as a result. According to this theological framework, which again originates with Israel in the Old Testament, righteousness is not a prerequisite for God's love. It is a consequence of God's love. That's the promise, and it's also the tension. For followers of Jesus, Easter and the resurrection is supposed to be a metamorphic event. It's not just Jesus who is changed. As our reading in 1 John says, when Jesus is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. We change. We become who we are in Jesus. It sounds nice, but sometimes that is harder work than we realize. I expect that if I sat down with each one of you here this morning, you could tell me about a season in your life in which you realized it was harder work than you had thought becoming who you are today. Maybe some of you are living in that season right now. I don't think it's just in our faith journeys that we experience the hardship of becoming. Growing up, making important transitions, getting out of abusive relationships, coming out as queer or trans, taking a risk in your professional life, embracing some aspect of yourself that you have been pressured to suppress, all of these and more are moments in which we experience the hard work of becoming who we are. I think being a disciple of Jesus is a calling to live in this tension. We are always trying to become who God has called us to be, but it is a delicate balance. You see, it's not necessarily that who we were was bad. God created and loved that person as well. I think this was something that I failed to understand when I was in high school and so eager to move on just because I was moving on and growing up and didn't mean that where I was and who I was meant nothing. I'm going to wrap up soon, but if you'll forgive me, I, I just kind of want to have a little interactive thing for a second. I promise it won't be, it won't be too strenuous. I'm just curious, by, by a show of hands, how many of you here today would say that you grew up uh, Episcopalian or Anglican or some kind of adjacent tradition? Would you mind just raising your hands? How many of you? It's a pretty, pretty good number, actually. Uh, all right. Okay, so how many of you would say that you did not grow up Episcopal or Anglican? Maybe you grew up in another Christian tradition or another religion. Maybe you grew up with no uh, religion at all. Would you mind raising your hands? I'm just curious, looking around. Uh, thank you very much. It's interesting. Um, here ends the, the interactive portion of, of the sermon. <laughs> So, uh, so maybe this is anecdotal, uh, but something that I have noticed in my experience, I'm coming up on uh, actually 10 years of being ordained, is that the second category is the one that seems to be growing to me. And uh, this is not because I think the whole world is converting to the Episcopal Church. I, I think it's because everybody is moving around. Fewer and fewer people have single ecclesial identities anymore. We're kind of picking stuff up as we go along. As I shared, I'm, I'm in that second category. Those identities, they change for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes we leave where we come from because we are rejecting some harmful ideas. Maybe we want to stay where we came from, but we were kicked out. Maybe sometimes we drift away without even meaning to, and maybe other times we don't so much leave as we are drawn somewhere else. Even if you are someone who is a so-called cradle Episcopalian, I think you would agree with me that the Episcopal Church has changed quite a bit in just one lifetime as it has struggled to become who it is. The effect of all this change, all of this becoming in our communities and in our faith is confusing. Who am I in this big amalgamation of faiths and convictions and values? 
So as one answer to that question, let me, let me just close with one, one last thought, okay? This is something that I have learned in my journey, and I think it's one we can hear in our Easter season readings this morning. So in our gospel for today, we have Luke's account of the final resurrection appearance of Jesus to his disciples before the ascension. And one of the aspects of this story that Luke really emphasizes heavily uh, above and beyond some of the other accounts is this, is this fact that, that Jesus' resurrection is bodily. Luke really wants to get this point across. It's really Jesus in his body, in that room, with the disciples. And this is why Jesus invites them to touch his body. This is why he kind of demonstrates his materiality by eating the fish. Apparently in antiquity, ghosts don't eat fish, and maybe they like chicken or something. I don't know. But um, so this is the same Jesus that Luke wants to say, right? There is continuity there. Despite the radical transformation of the resurrection, despite the promise of newness and of recreation, the Jesus that the disciples knew before Good Friday is still there somehow in that room. And I believe this is true also for how we should understand our ongoing transformations as disciples of Jesus. As much as we change, as much as we grow, God's faithfulness to the inherent goodness of creation means that who we were stays with us. And I know that for some of you, that might actually be hard to hear. Because who you were and where you were was painful. Because staying that person and staying in that place would have meant death. And if that's you, I hope you hear me. I am not saying you need to go back. Please, for the love of God, don't go back. What I am saying is that God was with you then, too. And who God was to you then, that presence is something that you still carry with you today. By the grace of God, you cannot get away from it. It is a part of who you are. God does not abandon who you were. God transforms it, just like Jesus' body. And recognizing that is part of our call to discipleship, discerning what's good and what's bad from our past. What do we take with us? What do we leave behind? All of that takes wisdom. It takes maturity. It takes faith. But when we do that hard work, we participate in Jesus' resurrection. We become who God is calling us to be. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit, he came incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Daniel, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation and for those on the prayer list. You may add your own petitions silently or aloud. Kathleen, Jerry. Hear us, Lord. Your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. For Ms. Daughter Zoe, who's just gave us today. For Jack Shepard's discharge from the hospital. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercies. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for the restoration of peace for all the world who suffer through oppression, conflict, and war. Eternal God, in, in whose, whose perfect, perfect kingdom, kingdom no, no sword is drawn, but, but the sword of righteousness, no strength known, but, but the strength of love, so mightily spread abroad your spirit, that all peoples may be gathered under the banner of the Prince of Peace, as children of one Father, to whom be dominion and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave of himself an offering and sacrifice to God.
At St. Martin's, we believe this is God's table. All are welcome to come and receive the sacrament. Healing prayers will be offered in the side chapel. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Always, everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O oh Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, return all things to your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary and Martha and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God's love for God's loving people.
Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and to serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. My friends, life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Please be seated for a few announcements. Thank you to Reed this morning for a... a Stunning, stunning sermon. And you know, you're in the Episcopal Church, that applause is the equivalent of a standing ovation at Lincoln Center. But thank you. I mean, it was altar call for you. That sermon had it all. Old Testament, New Testament, warm personal anecdote, biblical scholarship. I don't often use sports metaphors, but he hit it out of the park. It was terrific. Thank you. Thank you. And as for the choir, I am going to be driven to a thesaurus one of these days because I'm running out of adjectives. You know, after Holy Week, what more could you say? But today was glorious. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now, more announcements. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Law, and I am on this year's nominating committee, which includes people rotating off the vestry this year and two non-vestry parishioners. Our job is to propose a slate of candidates for election to the vestry at our annual parish meeting on June 9th. This year, we need to find at least six candidates. To determine a strong slate of candidates, we need your help. Serving on the vestry provides a unique opportunity to help support the mission, steward the resources, and shape the future of St. Martin's, particularly during a transition when a new rector will be called to join us. If you think that you, or someone you know, would have the time, enthusiasm, experience, and skills needed for this important service, please convey your suggestions for candidates to anyone on the nominating committee no later than Sunday, April 28th. The committee includes Barb Thompson, Tom Sibson, Carol Horn Penn, Jim Fairburn, Sandy Gould, myself, and Susan McBride. For any of those people who are here, would you please stand up? Anyone on the nominating committee? Most of the committee is here. Um, after considering all candidates, we will publish our proposed slate of new vestry members on Sunday, May 12th. Uh, there is one more chance after that to suggest people, but it has to be in writing with 10 signatures. If you have any questions about vestry service, please don't hesitate to ask any of us or any member of the vestry. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Michaela. I am the acolyte today, and I also schedule the acolytes. Um, this is a vital ministry to our church, and um, we have been getting lower, decreasing numbers in the past couple of years. So if this is a ministry that you're interested in participating in, uh, please reach out to me. My email is in the announcements, um, or you can come find me after the service and chat with me. We would love to have you. Thank you. Uh, the Face to Face, now as St. Martin's partner organizations, 
has their um, annual fundraiser next Saturday at the Chestnut Hill College. If you have not yet bought a ticket or a raffle ticket, um, see me across the way after, after the service. I'll, I have some here for you. Our closing hymn is hymn 492. <laughs> Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.